Greetings everyone, Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Questions and Answers. Today is Saturday, August the 17th. Hope everyone's having a great afternoon. Kind of hot and sticky and muggy here in the Hudson Valley in New York. But you know what? Nice enough to sit outside today and do this show and spend the next half hour or 40 minutes with you guys. So let's get started. Uh, I've chosen a uh, number of songs, a uh, number of songs, a <laughs> number of questions uh, to kind of cover today and to answer someone else's question from recently they asked about how many questions we generally get uh, each week for this show it, it's usually a hundred plus all right so you know how far I've got to whittle it down so uh, first question is from Anthony Parole Anthony asked you recently did a top 10 sweet songs your number one song was Fox on the Run can you talk about the album version versus the radio version two very different versions yeah absolutely they are so the original album version okay the uk album version was a very heavy guitar driven song you know all the trademark hooks and everything and the melodies of fox on the run were still present however it was a much more guitar and riff dominated version of that song as well as had a very lengthy and pretty kick-ass guitar solo as well whereas the the single version the radio version the american version uh, they replaced a lot of the really heavy riffs with some synths, uh, a couple little synth solos in there. The guitar solo is really short, almost non-existent in the Americanized version. But, you know, the trademark, like I said, the, all the hooks and melodies of that song was, was ever-present. But it obviously was done in a more kind of pop format as opposed to the, the original heavy rock version. They're both great for what they are. I could listen to either or, love them. Obviously, my real, real close love would be for the original version, the, the heavier guitar version, but they're both great. A lot of people only know the more you know pop-oriented, radio-oriented one. Uh, they're both great. It's, just, it's a great song no matter how you look at it. But yeah, they're two very different songs. So if you uh, have only heard one or the other, you should go check out the other, right? From Arnaud B. Hey, Pete. The guitar solos of Slayer are a significant subject of controversy among metal fans. What's your take on it? Okay. I almost wasn't going to answer this one, but then I think it, uh, it deserves a little pondering here. So I've been a fan of Slayer since they first came out in the early 80s. And, you know, Slayer's guitar solos by, you know, Kerry King and Jeff Hanneman, not the most virtuoso solos you're ever going to hear. It's not to say that there weren't plenty of pretty cool Slayer solos, but it was just an excuse to, you know, do some lightning runs up and down the fretboard with a lot of whammy bar wrangling. That's basically Slayer solos. Many of them sound the same. Uh, do they fit most of those songs? Yeah, they do. Uh, but I think most people would have liked to have heard something a little more complicated virtuoso, uh, less noisy perhaps. It wasn't always Slayer's thing, right? I mean, that, that was Slayer. But uh, like I said, there are some Slayer solos that I think are pretty damn cool, but a lot of them are just like all the same. And, you know, it's just like, just kind of like fast, noisy nonsense, which was kind of the appeal of it, right? And, yeah, people have been talking about Slayer guitar solos for decades and decades, uh, and I'm sure they'll continue to do so. From Lazarus. New question, Pete. If the new Sticks is playing a show and are on the same night, if the new Sticks is playing a show and on the same night right down the road, Dennis DeYoung and his band are playing a show of the music of Sticks, and you can only go to one show, which would you choose and why? Thank you for SOT. You're very welcome. Uh, I would choose Sticks. I, I've seen both, and I love both. Okay. My deal is that essentially they're going to play a lot of the same tunes. Except Dennis's band are going to play Babe and The Best of Times and, you know, those couple of handful, you know, a couple of the solo schmaltzy pop tunes, which, quite frankly, I never need to hear. Dennis has a great band. Dennis's band is kick-ass, okay? And, but they're going to do basically a lot of the same tunes. I'm a huge Tommy Shaw fan, and I love JY. That kind of tips the scale for me, okay? Lawrence Gowan. Great keyboard player, really good front man, good vocalist. Kind of has that Dennis DeYoung thing going on with his voice. Uh, he's a plus, you know, great drummer, great bass player. It's, it's just that they're just a happening band. 
And in addition to playing all those kick-ass stick songs that I really want to hear, they're going to play some of the more recent stuff they've done. You know, maybe not a lot of it. You know, maybe they'll play something off their last album, which was great. Uh, you know, The Mission. And you're not going to hear that from Dennis, right? So I would go see Sticks any day. But again, Dennis and his band are fantastic at what they do. You know, I, I took my wife to see both. And she much preferred the Dennis DeYoung show because they played those ballads that she loves, which they didn't play them at the Sticks show. And those, those are most of the tunes that she really knows best. You know, she knows like, you know, Renegade and Blue Collar Man and a couple others. But for the most part, she wants to hear, you know, those ballad tunes because that's, that's really all she ever knew from Sticks. But both bands are great. I would choose Sticks proper, though. From Stuart Dunn. Hey, Pete, thanks so much for the answer last time around to my question on remasters. Have you ordered the remasters of Renaissance albums reviewed later in the week after seeing your review? Of the, oh, well, oh, he has ordered the uh, Renaissance remasters. Good. I'm glad you watched the new product show. Yeah, they're fabulous. Uh, i got to get novella. Uh, come to think of it. Question this time may be a hint for a new series for you. I love the whole family tree concept around my favorite groups like Deep Purple, Uriah Heep, Symphony X, and Dream Theater, hunting down albums featuring members who have passed through these core groups. Particularly interested to hear about any suggestions of obscure or hard to find members of those trees. What say you, almighty sage? So I guess you would like me to do like a family tree type of thing. I mean, I could, but I mean, I've kind of already done that on the history of shows. Like, I've done a history of Uriah Heep and a history of Deep Purple, and I pretty much, like, talked about all the different offshoot bands. I've done a White Snake, you know, history of. We've done the Black Sabbath thing. Right there, you got four bands and Rainbow. You got all these bands that are kind of tied together in a weird way. Um, you know, I'll have to think about it. You know, because I think sometimes if, if I could do more of these history of shows, that would kind of take care of it. I haven't been able to do enough of those recently. But uh, it's still a cool thing. Yeah, the history, I love the whole, like, family tree kind of concept because it's just like you've got, like, so many of these bands have all these members that have passed in and out and gone and formed this band, and then from the seeds of that band was this band. It's just like it's, like, never-ending, but very cool. Interesting concept. Thanks for that. Uh, from Bill Z. Jr., hey, Pete, just a suggestion. Would you ever consider putting a summary of the highlights of these videos in this in the summary of the video? So basically, what you want me to do is summarize everything I talk about here on the questions and answers show, Bill. Then why would people want to watch it then? You know, guys, you gotta you gotta do the work. I mean, if I'm gonna do these shows, you gotta listen to them. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make it any simpler for you. Um, you know, the only thing I might do is like put a list of some of the questions that are discussed, uh, but I'm not gonna summarize my answers. And, and it's just you know, then why bother doing the video? You know, come on, guys. I understand that. As a, as a society nowadays, we have very limited attention span on stuff. But if you guys can't sit through 35, 40 minutes of some interesting discussion, then I won't do the show anymore. All right? So I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm already spending a lot of time doing the research for what I'm going to cover and spending a half hour, 45 minutes recording it. I'm not going to then spend another hour summarize everything we talked about, which is going to entail me re-watching the show over and over again. I mean, at some point, we all have to do a little bit of work here, right? So while I appreciate, you know, what you're asking, um, don't know if I'm going to go that route. Might I just put a little list of some of the questions that are asked? Possibly. Okay, that, that maybe I can do because I've already kind of got that here. So if that's what you're asking, I could probably do that. Um, but, it, but again, if I do that, then people are going to start skipping around. And it's like, you know, I think the point is that everybody should hopefully be interested in everything we're talking about here. Just my take from Blackbird's Wrath. Hey Pete, I think it's a first time question from, from someone, from this viewer. Black, Blackbird's Wrath. I've got a hypothetical for you. If somehow every old or middle-aged person alive was given the body they had when they were young and no one was subject to aging or dying of disease for the next thousand years, how do you think the modern music industry would be affected with everyone alive from previous generations being able to not only com compete with their grandchildren, but also live to influence and compete with future generations. I mean, I think it would be huge, wouldn't it? Because then you have like all these older folks who now aren't going anywhere, still being able to talk about and kind of push the old great music that they listen to on a lot of these new kids who are listening to garbage and hopefully influencing them. Because, you know, weren't we all to an extent influenced by some of the music or the movies or whatever that our parents and our grandparents watched and listened to? Sure, right? To an extent. Uh, you know, some of us 
Yeah, like, you know, me, for instance, my parents and my grand not huge music fans. You know, my grandparents listen to a lot of, like, Sinatra, Dean Martin, you know, Italian music. My grandparents on my father's side, who are Spanish, um, listen to a lot of Brazilian and Spanish, you know, music from Spain, a lot of, you know, that kind of stuff. It's cool. Not really what I was into. Uh, my father, you know, listened to a bit of that, the Beatles, more of a radio guy. My father really didn't buy a lot of records or anything like that. My mother loved the crooners. You know, so like Johnny Mathis and Burt Bacharach and um, uh, Barry Manilow and uh, God, I'm missing some other important ones that she listened to all the time. Uh, did I say Johnny Mathis? I think Engelbert Humperdinck. So my mother liked those kind of guys. So, you know, when I started listening to, you know, Kiss and uh, Paul McCartney, Wings and the Eagles and the ELO and then eventually Zeppelin, Sabbath and Purple and Maiden and, Sa and uh, you know, Priest and Scorpions and all that kind of stuff. They were like, ah, you know, my God. So, um, but yeah, I think it'd be kind of cool if we had, if, you know, if I all of a sudden was going to live till God knows. I mean, I'd still be preaching like I'm preaching right now, right? To all the younger kids, trying to get them to say, hey, this is some classic stuff that was released way before you were born that you need to check out. Never mind what the radio and Spotify is telling you uh, what to listen to or your stupid uh, satellite thing or, you know, whatever it is you they hear. That, you know, here's some good stuff. Check this out. Interesting question. From Peter M. Back when you had your vinyl collection, were you listening to these obscure rock and prog bands or did you discover more of these after you moved to CD? If you had a lot of these bands on vinyl, you must have had a really valuable collection. No, no, not at all. Um, I would say when I was still, when I was buying vinyl, I had a ton of like, um, you know, all the hard rock and metal stuff of the day. So I had, you know, a, show, a whole bunch of Sabbath albums, Zeppelin, Scorpions, Rainbow Priest, Maiden, uh, you know, ELO, Eagles, Paul McCartney, Wings, Kansas, Meatloaf, The Who, uh, you know, the Metallica stuff, Slayer, Celtic Frost, uh, some Genesis, cup some Yes. You know, I, had, I was all over the map. I didn't really have a lot of really rare stuff. Probably the rarest stuff I had was like the rare like metal stuff that was coming out like in the early mid '80s before I stopped collecting vinyl. So you know, I would go and pick up like all those like you know kind of obscure new wave of British heavy metal import albums, okay, or those you know uh, import thrash underground thrash bands from all around the globe, stuff like that. I had some old like loudness Japanese imports and things like that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really start getting into Prague heavily until, like, you know, the early 90s. So I really had very little of that kind of stuff until I started collecting CDs. So once I started collecting CDs and, you know, the Internet, you know, and also remember, there was no Internet back when I was collecting vinyl. So you basically were, what, what did you buy? What was at the local record shop? And I was lucky enough I had a couple of record shops that had, like, import sections, so I would buy some of that stuff. But... You know, there was no, there was no surfing the web and trying to find this, you know, rare album that was released in uh, Yugoslavia or whatever, right? There, there was no such thing. So it's, it was until like the early 90s and, you know, the advent of the internet and all of a sudden, you know, online CD shops and what have you that I started being able to find a lot of really cool stuff and it just kind of exploded from there. From uh, Jamie Laszlo, Bohemian Rhapsody has started a trend of rock biopics. It certainly has. There's Bowie and Elvis movies in the works. What artist band would you like to see portrayed in a movie? And who would you cast as the lead? And for bonus points, what would you title the movie? All right, so I'm going to pick Black Sabbath because I, I've i always been like... And number two, probably the Rolling Stones. Uh, I, would, I just think a Sabbath biopic would be fucking awesome because they were just such a cast of characters and they just have such a kind of sex, drug, sex drugs and rock and roll-y kind of history, you know, um, and I would, what I would title it, I, I would title it as the, uh, I would title it the, basically the name of the, the album that I really don't like much, which is Never Say Die, I think that would be, you know, Black, Never Say Die, the Black Sabbath story, I think would be awesome, or just Never Say Die, uh, as far, you know, I don't know who, who I would like to see playing, like Ozzy and Tony and Geezer and Bill, I, you know, I don't know, that's not for me to decide, or you know, who would do that, I don't know, uh, probably have to be actual British actors, you know, while it's okay to see, you know, we see a lot of times in Hollywood now we see American actors portraying British characters with their fake accent and vice versa, and, you know, Australian actors portraying English, you know, or American characters and hiding the accent, you know, let's get some 
let's get some people who actually speak the language, right? The and have the, the correct accent. So I don't know. It'd be interesting. I'd have to ponder that a little bit more. Who would I get to uh, to play the Sabbath guys? I don't know, but I think that would be a great movie. Um, and you know, God, you'd have to it'd probably have to be a pretty long movie because I or you know, do it? Is it just? Do they just go from the beginnings? to like when Ozzy leaves and maybe go a few years after that so you can cover the kind of the Dio years and Ozzy solo. You probably have to do that and then maybe at the end have them come together. I don't know. Because it's, it's a pretty long history, right? It's pretty complicated. From Russell Gentile. Or Gentile. I never know how to say your name. Can you list a handful of bands or discuss some you grew up loving but go back to the... But uh, wait. But go back today and find uninteresting or just not doing it for you these days. Also, what bands have you grown even more fond of in the last 10 to 15 years? All right, so as far as the bands that I, I really dug when I was younger, at least for a time period, and today I just just can't really get into, uh, God, Anthrax. I was hugely into Anthrax in like the most of the you know mid-late 80s. Well, when did Anthrax start getting big? Probably, what, 80? God, I remember going to college in 84 and... I mean, that's, I think, when Anthrax really started to hit big was right around that time. And I, I was really into Anthrax in the 80s. Saw them live so many times, saw them in clubs, moshed so many times to Anthrax. Um, and most of my friends were into Anthrax at the time. And, you know, and then uh, Belladonna left the band. And then uh, John Bush, as a giant branch from one of my old trees here, just fell off. All righty then. I guess I'll have to be cleaning that up later. Um, <laughs> I got some dead trees on the perimeter of the property, and then little by little, all the branches are falling off. Anyway, back to Anthrax. So, yeah, Joey Belladonna left. John Bush from Armored Saint came into the band, and I thought he did a really great job. And I liked those couple albums he did with the band, and I was still into him then. And then Joey came back. And um, I kind of stopped listening to Anthrax for a while. In a couple of years, like for a long while, just, I don't know. I just found that their their music had not aged well, as opposed to some of the other um, thrash bands that I loved. And I tried to go back and listen to them like last couple of years, and I just find those all those '80s albums just sound very juvenile to me, and um, just real kind of gimmicky. And this whole like, hey, we're we're cool guys wearing shorts and jams, and we mosh, and we're you know all this kind of stuff. And I, I know that's the attitude I had back in the day too. But I just find their music just, ha God, I listen to those albums and I'm like, they just don't do it for me anymore. I tried. I tried. Um, Wasp, you know, I, I dug Wasp for like you know, the first couple albums. But man, I can listen to their music now and it just doesn't do anything for me. Uh, and I'll throw Motley Crue out there. Now, most of you who have followed the show know that I really detest Motley Crue a lot. Uh, but I was a fan of those first two albums, you know. The first two albums are really good. I remember, you know. Shout Out the Devil came out. I was totally into that. Seeing them on tour, I was like, yes, I was a Motley Crue fan. And then, you know, they released another album and then another album. And I was like, this sucks. And then uh, I just got to really dislike the guys in the band, specifically like Tommy Lee and Vince Neil, especially Vince Neil. God, he's just a waste of space, that guy. And I just, I think Tom, you know, um, Tommy's just a, uh, he's, I just don't know if he's, a, he just doesn't seem like a really good person to me. Um, you know, but whatever. I know people love him and that's fine, but I just, I have no use for either. Any, any of those three bands. I think if I, if I were to take one that I probably still could listen to at least a little bit, probably be Wasp or maybe the 90s Anthrax stuff. But man, Motley Crue, oh God. Uh, as far as the bands that I've grown to love even more, I would say like in the last decade or so, man, Kansas Sticks and Journey. Can't get enough of it, any of them, and it's just I just and I've always liked them, always liked them. But man, I like them even more nowadays. I don't know what it is. I guess you know the the older person in me has come to appreciate the kind of the real melodic nature of their music. All three of them, uh, all three of them, you know, especially Kansas and Sticks, they really scratch my progressive uh, need for need for proggy music as well as heavy music. Uh, Journey just, you know, Journey is a special band for me because it's like one of the few groups that my wife and I really agree on. And I just, I just really love Journey songs, man. That's, they're great, great and great guitar player. I love Neil Schoen. Um, so those three bands definitely I like even more now than I liked back in the day. And that's saying something because I was always a big fan of all three of them. 
from uh, MBF78. Here's a quick, big, quick question for you. This relates to the last question a little bit. Whenever anybody talks about the big four, nobody ever seems to talk about anthrax anymore. Even you hardly ever mention them. Or if you have, I might not have caught it. My question is, what happened? Did they do something really bad that caused people to shun them? Or have they just fallen out of favor with the fans more so than the other three? You know what? I think it's just, I think a lot of people, and again, I don't want to speak for other people, but just based on some conversations I've had, there's a lot of people who feel the same as I do. That like, you know what? Their music just hasn't aged well. It was, their brand of thrash was kind of fun, you know, as a 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old back in the 80s. But now, all these years later, you listen to the Anthrax albums. And like I said, they just sound really juvenile to me, as opposed to the more serious songs and styles of Megadeth, Metallica up to a point, uh, and it's certainly Slayer. I just, you know, even if I go back and I listen to, I'll go listen to like Hell Awaits and then I'll put on, you know, any of those Anthrax albums, you know, or next to any of the Megadeth albums, I'm like, God, this almost doesn't fit. I'd, I'd rather put on a fucking, any Overkill album over the Anthrax. And I like, I like Overkill a lot, but I go back and listen nowadays and I'm thinking, you know what, Overkill should have been that in that big four. Testament should have been in that big four, in my opinion, over Anthrax. But that's the way I feel about it now. I wouldn't have said that 30 years ago. Okay? So, uh, but, you know, whatever. From uh, Lisa T. Lisa, how are you? I knew you'd come back with a Tull question at some point. I have a Jethro Tull-related question to ask. Tull put out the Crest of a Knave album, and it was a pretty big success. It went gold in the U.S. It is regarded a comeback album for them because they hadn't really sold much in the U.S. since Stormwatch. But when they released Rock Island two years later... Uh, it didn't sell much at all. My question is, why do bands have certain comeback albums that sell a lot, but when they continue to put new albums out, they don't really sell a lot of copies? If a band has a comeback album that sells well, shouldn't the albums after it sell well? Other bands that, that I can think of that this happened to is Cheap Trick with Lap of Luxury, Deep Purple's Perfect Strangers. Uh, yeah, because um, the album after Perfect Strangers, Perfect Strangers did bang up business and then, you know, that was kind of it after that, right? Uh, those albums were comeback albums, but after that, certain albums, the albums afterwards didn't sell much in the U.S. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I think what it has to do with is that there is an anticipation. And, you know, with Tull, they really, they were still around, but, you know, they, you know, they released a couple albums that made, you know, Broadsword and the Beast did pretty well, right? But then, uh, you know, they had that other all-electronic album, which... That album sucks. <laughs> Sorry, I just don't like that album at all. The A album didn't do too well. Stormwatch did pretty well. Uh, I just think, you know, the 80s were really changing. I think, to an extent, Tull kind of changed with the 80s because their, their sound kind of uh, adjusted a bit. You know, Crest of the Nave has some really good songs on it that I think became Tull fan favorites. You know, like, you know, Farm on the Freeway, Budapest. Great tunes, Steel Monkey to an extent. Steel Monkey got some, you know, a little bit of uh, play on the radio. I think, you know, Crest had a very accessible sound. You know, a lot of people kind of compare that album, stylistically speaking, to like uh, almost Dire Straits. Okay, Dire Straits are pretty hot at the time. So I think that had something else to do with it. Um, what was really weird is that album was released in 87, and they wound up when. That is not a heavy album by any means. And they wound up winning a fucking Grammy in 89 for best hard hard rock metal, best heavy metal record of the year. But their album was released two years prior. I, I didn't understand that at all. I mean, that made absolute. I mean, I'm glad that Toll won a Grammy, but they won it for the wrong reasons and the wrong category for the wrong album from the wrong year. It's like, come on, dudes. I mean, the Grammy committee, give me a fucking break. Um <laughs> I'm sure that's how the, the band felt about it. The band were probably like, oh, this is really cool. Why do we win this now? You know? Uh, Metallica were waiting backstage for that win. They were probably just sitting there like, Tull's cool, but what the fuck, you know? So anyway, that's the story for another day. Uh, Rock Island, you know, Rock Island's a decent enough album. It's not as good an album as Crest. Rock Island, I think, goes back, you know, Rock Island, I think, suffers from being somewhat mediocre. Uh, you know, Kiss and Willie's a good tune. That got a little bit of airplay. Uh, the Rock Island title track is great. Whaler's Dues is cool. Another Christmas song is cool. I mean, that wound up being on the uh, the Christmas set that was released many, many years later. Um, I just think, you know, there was excitement around Crest. It had some good tunes, had an accessible sound. I think Rock Island kind of sounded more like a traditional 
Jethro Tull album, just trying to get through the 80s. And I, I think, you know, people's – another thing, you know, we, I've talked about this a lot in recent weeks. A lot of people, especially in this country, have limited attention spans. And that unfortunately started in the 80s, okay? Uh, whereas, you know, you started – all of a sudden you started getting spoon-fed. All right, here's what you should listen to based on, you know, the MTV videos. Again, you know, the, we're talking two albums here that came out at the height of the MTV sensation years, uh, you know. Crest of a Knave, I believe Steel Monkey was a video that they played on uh, MTV. Uh, Kiss and Willie, I believe, also was a video that they released on MTV. A ridiculous one, if I remember correctly. So, you know, by this time, people were buying what was popular on MTV, what was played on the radio. And, you know, Rock Island wasn't really cutting the mustard for the time. A fine enough album for what it is, but again, I think that, you know, these bands made these kind of comebacks. The comeback was like, oh, great for a year, great album, go see them on tour, yeah, oh, you know, but then here today, gone tomorrow. All right, yeah, we've moved on from that. We're now listening to the final countdown, and we're listening to, uh, you know, the new Bon Jovi album, or we're listening to, uh, you know, whatever it is, right? And just people move on really quick now in this country. They move on from stuff really, really quickly. You know, the old guard, the fan, longtime fans of the band are still listening to Tull, right? They were still listening to Tull. Um, but, you know, they're not going to attract any new viewers, unfortunately. That's just the way it was. Same, it was the same thing with Deep Purple, you know, Perfect Strangers came out. Awesome. Okay. Big tour, huge selling tour, album so well. And then House of Blue Light came out a couple of years later, and it's like all of a sudden, bloop. Oh, they're still around? It's like, yeah. Right. From Ninja Badger. Hi, Pete. My question is, what's your opinion of digital download-only albums? I personally have not and will not buy downloads as I love CDs and the experience of receiving and going through my new purchase. Is it far less prevalent in rock? It is far less prevalent in rock, but it has been showing up slowly. John Five has been doing this, plus the Swedish group Violet Janine have done it. Is this, unfortunately, the way of the future, and what do you, what would you do if it is? I mean, sadly, that's probably the case. I, like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I don't think CDs are going away anytime soon, but that does not mean that if a band is going to self-release a new recording that they've done, they may choose to not release it on CD. They may choose not to release it on vinyl. They may choose to release it only as uh, you know, some sort of a stream or a digital download. And I'm seeing a lot of bands doing that. I, I get you know, people all the time tell me about, oh, have you heard about this great young band, you know, this new metal group or this new stoner group or this new classic hard rock sounding group, or this new prog group, you know what, they, they're, they're uh, self-releasing their new music. Go check out their, their band camp page. And I'm like, you know, when I go and I listen, I'm like, oh, this is great. How can I get this? And they're like, no, they're not leasing any physical product. They're not releasing any physical product, download, purchase only. And I'm like... My problem is, and I know that's probably the wave of the future, my problem is you start purchasing all these downloads and then you put them where, right? They sit on your computer, you know, maybe you put them onto an iPod or on your phone or whatever. It's like, but they're just, they're there amongst all these other million files. Um, I tend to, you know, again, I've never purchased any uh, digital albums, never. You know, I purchased, God, five, six, seven, eight years ago, I purchased a single, digital single from The Who, um, Oh God! What the hell's the name of the song? Something, something, boy. I don't remember. It, it was it was only ever available on like some greatest hits set, which I didn't need, of course, because I got all the Who stuff. And I was like, I really like that tune, so I bought it for like ninety nine cents off iTunes, and it's I think it's sitting on my iPod or whatever. But again, yeah, whatever. I I also am old school, and I like to have physical product because then it's like a reminder that I got something. I bring them in the car; they circulate with me around the house for a while until I've listened to them a bunch of times, and I put them on the shelf, right? They're they're on my they're on my iPod or one of my iPods or in my iTunes. But I just, um, yeah. But it's probably the way of the world, you know. Hopefully not. The problem is so many new bands are foregoing hooking up with record labels. They want to release their own stuff. And, you know, it costs money to produce CDs, right? If they don't have it. So they're doing these digital-only releases. And if you want the music, that's what you got to do, right? You know, I, I sometimes wonder if at some point in time, if all this kind of comes to pass and, you know, there's no more physical product anymore, I may just decide to say, fuck it, I've got 9,000 CDs. I have all the music I would ever need. I could, I could literally survive just fine listening to everything I have in my collection for the rest of my life. Because it's all the stuff I love, right? It may come to that. You never know. From Matty Boy Walker, my question today is on Wishbone Ash. 
What's your favorite period by them? And do you think that the band today calling themselves Wishbone Ash and Martin Turner's lineup are just as good as e each other? Um, well, I obviously have to say that the Mark I version of Wishbone Ash is probably the, the best by default. So that is uh, Martin Turner, Ted Turner, Andy Powell, and Martin Upton. Okay. Um, by default. Because that lineup produced the Wishbone Ash self-titled debut, Argus, you know, Wishbone 4, and uh, The Pilgrimage. Great albums, right? For a reason. Okay, some great songs on there. Uh, I, my personal favorites, if you watch my Wishbone Ash Top 10 Song Show from this week, um, my personal favorite albums from that period is the self-titled debut in Argus. Pilgrimage and, and Wishbone 4 are very solid. Not nearly as good as those other two albums, in my opinion, but they have great songs on them. Uh, once Ted Turner left the band after the Wishbone 4 album, Laurie Weisfield joined the band on co-lead guitar, and I think that potentially could be the best lineup that this band ever had. Okay, I've said it here for it. I, I personally think that Laurie, he was a much better, I'm not going to say much better, he, I believe, is a better guitar player than Ted Turner. I find his playing and his songwriting and his backing vocals absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think that those albums that Laurie did with the band, you know, there's, you know, there's the rub, no smoke without fire. I mean, you know, there's, there's a whole string of albums starting from like what 70, 74, 75, all the way through the early 80s. It's fantastic albums underrated albums. I know most people, when they talk about Wishbone Ash, everybody goes back to the first four albums, and I get it. That's, you know, older folks who, that's what they grew up with. That's the, But I'm telling you, if you haven't listened to those, the rest of those albums from the 70s, those are damn good. Front Page News, man, all the, those, those are some seriously good albums there. So, I would say by default, I'm going to pick the first version of Wishbone Ash, but the second is right up there. And in fact, you know what? I had this discussion with someone else. Uh, it was on our Facebook page. I don't know. Maybe it was on the uh, in the comments and feedback of the Wishbone Ash Top Ten Song Show. But someone had mentioned how if they were to pick ten of their favorite Wishbone Ash tunes, it would be all the tracks that are on the Wishbone Ash Live Dates album, the first one, which has the original lineup. Um, and I should have said Steve Upton before, not Martin Upton on drums. Uh, I will go on record saying that I actually like Wishbone Ash live dates two better than the first one. I just think that the performances on the second live dates album are much better than the first. And I think that the live versions of the songs on live dates two are better than the studio versions. I don't necessarily think that of some of the live versions of the songs on the original live dates as opposed to the studio counterparts. Okay? They're very they're excellent. But I think that uh, Live Dates 2 is spectacular and really improves on the studio versions. Whereas, you know, those early studio versions, those early Wishbone Ash tunes, great, right? Um, and they're really cool on the Live Dates album, but, you know, anyway. And as far as both the, the, the coexisting, yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, everybody always knows that uh, there's a big legal thing, big fight between the band members. You've got Andy Powell and his version of Wishbone Ash. He's got the name. He won it in court. Uh, a fine band. I love Andy. Uh, he has been doing the Wishbone Ash legacy right for so many years. Uh, in recent years, you know, Martin Turner, for a while he was doing Martin Turner's Wishbone Ash. I don't know if he's still using that name. I think now it's just Martin Turner. That's the name of the band. He's got a great band. And they've released a couple of albums, studio albums, which, which are fantastic. Again, you know, that spirit of the early Wishbone Ash is there. Um, you know, for a lot of people, they, they're like, well, Martin was kind of the voice. He sang most of the early songs, and he's a great bass player, and they, they kind of lean towards there, whereas you know, you got Andy, who was the guitar voice, but Andy has become a very good singer, okay? And he does those old tunes justice. So it's cool to have both, I guess. Like I said on the Top Ten Song Show, it would be nice if someday they could kiss and make up. I don't think that's ever going to happen. So, uh, But you can't go wrong with either or. You know what? Enjoy them both. There's no sense in picking one over the other. Enjoying both. Uh, it's, the, you know, it's a win-win for all of us. For Scala Grimmer Kvultulsson, 
What's up, Scala Grimmer? Uh, hey, Pete, what do you think about bands with two or more drummers playing simultaneously like King Crimson on their recent tours? I must admit that it does not do much for me. I prefer one powerful drummer that you can concentrate on. Let me tell you something. I mean, the majority of what you're going to see is one drummer in most bands. So I think for those couple of bands that do the two drummers or in Crimson's case, three drummers, uh, enjoy it for what it is. I personally, I, you know, I saw, I'm going to see Crimson next month, uh, but I saw them a year and a half ago with the three drummers and blew my mind. Absolutely unbelievable. If it's done right, I got no issues with it. In fact, I, you know, loved and went to see the Allman Brothers many times over the course of my life, and they were another band that did it perfectly because you got two guys doing something a little bit different, okay, but it matched so well together. You know, I'm, I, you know, if you had two drummers who were playing all the exact drum parts, same drum parts, I mean, yeah, what's the point of that? But if you got guys who are doing some different stuff, I mean, it's just, it's the way to go. I, I tell you, go see Crimson with this, you know, three drum trio, man. It's like, it's killer. From NP, hey Pete, been a while since I posted a question, but have a good one this week. This is an offshoot of the question this week that asked about bands that have only made one album. I was thinking about bands that have unreleased albums that they made before their first album. For example, the Stalk Forest Group album before Blue Oyster Cult. That's a fine one. Uh, Wishbone Ashes First Light that was made before their first album. Another good one. Uh, Rainbow Band who recorded their first album became Midnight Sun. Yeah, that's 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 killer. Love that. Um, actually, both those albums are really good. Uh, can you think of any other examples of these? And do you have any favorites? I mean, the only one that really comes to mind, and I'm sure if I really dug deep, I could probably find a couple more. But um, the American hard rock band from the early mid 70s bang okay they 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 recorded an album called death of a country okay as their first album and that's what they took to the record labels and the record labels were like you know and they eventually signed with a cbs or columbia i forget which one uh they were like yeah this is cool we really like you guys but that's not the album we want you to release we want you to go into the studio and do something new okay which they did, <laughs> okay. Uh, they went and recorded a new album, which was great and everything like that. And that Death of a Country album, which was their, that was to be their first album, never got released, recorded it in 1971, never got released until 2004. So that is, you know, historically speaking, that is their first album. And you can actually get that album now. Uh, they had this a bang box set. If you love, man, I tell you, if you love, if you can uh, picture a combination of like Black Sabbath, Grand Funk Railroad, and the Beatles, that was bang. Okay, love them. Great, great band. They released um, God, four. Yeah, you can get the box set. It's, a, it's yellow, put out by Rise Above Relics. Uh, it's got that first album they did, Death of a Country, and the three albums after that all in one set. Very, very cool. That's one that comes to mind, uh, NP, right off the bat. From uh, David Pruitt. Hey, Pete, I've seen interviews with Getty Lee regarding his bass book. While the interview goes on, the interviewer finally gets to the point and asks Getty if he will ever do anything again with Alex. He doesn't give a definitive answer, but I think he's becoming antsy to continue making music, possibly with Alex. Do you think it would be sacrilege for Getty and Alex to continue making music together without Neil? No, I mean, if that's what they want, they got to earn a living, man, you know? That's, I mean, they don't need to call it Rush. I mean, the problem is, if they decide to go get together and do something, is the record label going to push and insist that they call it Rush? Does the general public want it to be called Rush? Can it be called Rush without Neil? That's the question, right? Because you're going to have some people are going to be like, they can't do Rush if there's no Neil involved. And I get that. Um, you know, could They could very easily go and get some other super drummer to come step in, you know, whoever it might be, you know. Um, speculate who they would but uh i i get the you know i mean alex has done some things here and there guested on some albums i think he if i'm not mistaken he's got a solo thing or something going on that he's working on i don't remember um but i don't think we've heard the last of those two guys and we know neil is is done with music and, I, and that's you know it's his prerogative and hey it's his life right uh i think the other two guys will resurface it's now been a while uh, I know I, I get the impression too that Getty is itching to do stuff, and while I would love to see those two guys do something, uh, but the problem is going to be well, if you got two thirds of the band, you know, can we have it be Rush again? So I don't know, um, but I think you know, they certainly can make new music without Neil. Why not? They can't just you know end their musical career just because Neil retired and wants to, doesn't want to play in music anymore. They got to go, you know, they got to make a living. I'm sure they don't need to work again, but I think the creative juices in each one of them 
will dictate that uh, you know they're going to do something, whether it's together or with someone else. You know, I think I think we'll see Getty doing something else, either with another name band or with some other name musicians putting together a new project um, before we see Alex, but that remains to be seen. From Chet Grablowski, hey Pete, you mentioned in your last show about a band being ahead of its time and I immediately thought of Angel. I was really into them in the latter part of the 70s and nobody else that I knew were. If they came out in the MTV era with all their hair metal videos, I think they would have been huge. Me and the wife just saw them a couple months ago at the Chance at Poughkeepsie and they were amazing. What do you think and can you think of another example of a band who avoided stardom due to bad timing? Well, Angel certainly. I think they were just a couple years too soon. Uh, I absolutely agree with you. I think they, they had the look, the image. I think if, uh, if they were allowed to, if they were still kind of around in that uh, early, mid-80s MTV era, they would have been huge. Another band, Stars, which if you went to the Chance show, you saw both of them. I think Stars also were probably four years too soon. Uh, I think Stars should have been huge also. Legs Diamond were another band. You know, Legs Diamond had that really cool kind of like... Um, American heavy rock thing going on with the keyboards and you know the, the hair and the, the guitars and you know they kind of had this like kind of like deep American deep purple sound but you know maybe a little too early for that it was like what 78 77 79 man they would have come out like 82 83 boom uh, Moxie from Canada kind of the same thing I think they were just maybe a couple years too too early um, Aviary you know I think Aviary also could have been like as big as like Journey, you know, or Foreigner. They had a, they had that thing going on, you know. Um, great hooks, great look, um, great musicianship, catchy tunes, but just man, a couple years too early, maybe. Uh, you know, speaking of a like band nowadays who would have been huge back then, you know, how about Rival Sons? You know, Rival Sons. Yeah, a lot of people know who they are now, but man, this, they've got what? How many albums now? It's like, and they're still not a household name. They're still not selling out big arenas. I mean, Rival Sun, if they had put out the music they've been putting out the last bunch of years, put these albums out in the 70s, they would have been enormous. Enormous. From Larry Wawa. Has an artist or band that you may have liked ever done or said something that made you not want to listen to them anymore? Well, you know, you know unlike a lot of people I know, um, I know plenty of people who will like a band or a singer or an artist or whatever, and then they'll read some tweet that they said or, or they'll read a statement about, you know, some political thing that they said or, you know, or whatever, or they, you know, they spit on someone in the front row or they, then they're just like, oh, that guy's a, that, that, that woman, they're, they're assholes. I'm never listening to them again. Um, I try to separate, you know, because they're all, they, they're all people too. People just make mistakes. People are all fools and idiots. I mean, deep down, I mean, just because they're you know in a band or singing in front of fifty thousand people, they're they're no different than you or me, really. Uh, they're just the, the spotlights on them all the time. So I try to separate myself from. Yeah, they said that. Yeah, okay, whatever. I still like their music. I, I know there's a lot of people who don't. They just like as soon as they hear something that they don't agree with that they did or said, they're like, ah, oh, that's it. I'm done listening to them. They're dead to me, type of thing. So I try not to do that too much. Um, I will say, like, the one thing, I actually have to think a lot about this, the one, the one thing that happened, like, in recent years that's turned me really off from a band that I dug, um, the black metal band Gorgoroth. I really dug them a lot when I first started getting into black metal. And, you know, you got, I, I fully understand that a lot of these, you know, Norwegian, Swedish black metal bands, they, they've got this, you know, they've got to live up to this image. And some of them dabbled in a lot of satanic stuff and rituals and all that kind of stuff. A lot of them just do it because it's part of the gimmick. And I get that. But man, I don't know. I, I, I bought or got sent, I don't remember, a number of years ago. Um, and I like the band. I still, I have all their albums on CD and, you know, I was, was really into them. And, I watched a live DVD concert of theirs I don't know, within the last 10 years, and I had never seen them live, obviously. And, I, and on stage, they've got, like, all these, like, goat heads, which were obviously from live animals, um, you know, decapitated goat heads on, like, stakes all around the stage. You know, and you could see it was hot in the place, and there's steaming and all this kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, God, that must have stank something nasty never mind even that just the fact that i'm such an animal lover and i just could not watch it and i understand they're trying to give this whole you know that's part of the the act that's part of the gimmick um but i was like man i don't need to watch it 
I just, I, I guess my skin's not that thick. I love animals too much to be sit there viewing dead goat heads and a lot of them on the stage surrounding this band. Uh, and while I still think that I still kind of dig their music, I just, I really haven't been able to listen to them since. It just really turned me off. So there you have it. From Gene Kirsten. Hey Pete, I just watched a YouTube video interview in which Vivian Campbell tells about Ronnie James Dio barely play, barely paid the Dio band members and promised them money after a couple of albums were completed. Campbell goes on to say that the promises never materialized, even though he reminded Ronnie many times. He says Ronnie pushed it off on his wife manager, Wendy Dio. None of that promised money was ever paid to the band members. Although I, uh, although I accept Campbell's story, this goes against everything I've ever heard or thought about Ronnie. What do you think here? I mean... The funny thing is, Vivian is the only one who said that. You never heard Vinny say that. I never heard Jimmy Bain say that. I never heard Claude Schnell say that. Or any of those guys that were in and out of uh, you know, Craig Goldie. I never heard any of those guys say that, ever. I just think, personally, that something deeper happened between Ronnie and Vivian. And Vinny's just got sour grapes. I mean, uh, Vivian's just got sour grapes about it. Because he's the only one who says this. And I... I've never met Ronnie personally, but I know some folks who knew him personally, and they have nothing but great things to say about the man and how generous he was and everything like that. And I, I find it hard to believe that Ronnie would not have paid his, I mean, come on, his right-hand guy, his super hot guitar stud, would not pay him after all those years in the band. I just, I find it really hard to believe, okay? And like I said, none of the other guys ever bitched about this. And it just, uh, you know, for you know, for many years, Vivian was saying bad things about Ronnie in the press. And then when Ronnie passed away, he kind of softened his stance a little bit. But now he seems to be back at it again. And I, uh, quite frankly, I don't get it. And if it if it's an issue he's got with Wendy Dio, who was you know the management, who was management there, in addition to being Ronnie's wife, then don't badmouth Ronnie if it was a Wendy thing, okay? Because maybe Ronnie wasn't in. You know, he's not the guy who actually paid people. I don't know. I'm just speaking from speculation here. I don't know. I just have a hard time believing it because I, I've never heard anybody else anywhere, either people I know who knew Ronnie or just interviews I've read with people who knew Ronnie. No one ever had a bad thing to say about the guy except for, well, maybe, maybe Richie Blackmore. <laughs> but we know that that's why that would be. But I've never heard anybody else say anything bad about Ronnie except for Vivian Campbell. So I don't know. There, there obviously was some beef there between those two guys. I don't know. Only Viv knows that now, right? From Michael Morgan, hey Pete, always love your show, especially your top ten list. My very first concert I ever seen was Rush, Moving Pictures. Uh, I won tickets from 98 KUPD in Phoenix that included backstage passes to meet the band. It was totally cool. My question to you is, what musicians have you met in the past? What did you talk about? What did you do, etc.? And who would you like to meet nowadays? For me, I would love to meet Jeff Lynn, Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Alan Parsons, Brian May, and many others. I would probably ask for autographs, talk about music. Maybe even get a quick lesson on playing something. What do you think? Also, would you feature live albums in your album Wars? Another feature I love. Yeah, like I've said numerous times over the last couple of weeks here on the Facebook page, uh, we are going to do the classic album Wars for the rest of this month, but then starting in September, we're going to switch over to classic live album Wars for a couple of months until I kind of exhaust that, and then I'm going to go back to the classic album Wars. I know a lot of people have been asking for live album Wars, and I'm going to do that because that'll be fun, and then we'll get back to regular classic album Wars because, quite frankly, I could be doing classic album Wars every day for the rest of my life, and that's a great way to get content on the uh, on the YouTube channel. So that's kind of the plan for now. As opposed to who, so who have I met? I mean, I met some cool people. Um, you know, I met Steve Hackett. I met Annie Haslam. From Renaissance, Steve Hackett from Genesis, uh, Rich Williams and Kerry Livgren from Kansas, uh, Jason Newstead, at the time was with Voivod, but he was also Metallica. Uh, I've hung out numerous times and I got pretty friendly with the guys in Meshuggah, Swedish uh, extreme metal band. Uh, I'm very good friends with Jeff Young, Jeff formerly of uh, Megadeth and a great guitar player and solo artist. Uh, I've met Mike Portnoy, Extreme Theater, currently with you know all sorts of bands. Uh, I count Eric Norlander and Lana Lane from Rocket Scientist as very good friends of mine. Um, I've met Carl Palmer from ELP. I've met uh, Derek Shulman, Malcolm Mortimer, and Gary Green from Gentle Giant. I will say all three great guys. Uh, Derek Shulman was, was such a gracious host when I met and hung out with him with, a, with him a couple, for a couple hours all those years ago. I haven't seen him since, but um, Gary Green, too, great guy. Met him numerous times. Uh, I've met Derek Sherinian, Extreme Theater, you know, 
black country community and so on. I've met a lot of guys over the years, a lot and a lot of metal bands and, and guys in metal bands, uh, extreme metal bands and progressive metal bands, power metal bands. Uh, I've met uh, Peter Tochgren from Hypocrisy and Pain. I mean, you know, so many of them. I've met um, Devin Townsend. Devin Townsend, totally cool guy. Uh, met some of the guys from Opeth. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's... It's been a cool gig of mine for the last, you know, 20 some odd years, having, you know, been able to meet a lot of my musical heroes and, you know, people I admire in the music business uh, and, you know, in, in, in bands and playing music. So that's been very, very cool. And uh, I wouldn't give any of that up for anything, you know, and I'm, I'm proud to call some of them friends, uh, many of them acquaintances, but they are always in. And, and what's great about it is, um, you know, you know, you make an impact on someone when you meet someone who obviously talks to people like me for a living. Right. And then you don't see them again for numerous years. And then you see them again and they remember the last time they saw you, which may have been, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago. And you wouldn't think they would because, you know, like I said, they talk to hundreds of guys like me. So uh, and, you know, what do you talk about? You talk about whatever. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you chit chat, you know, how's things going? If, if I see them on tour, talk about the tour. How's that going? Um, sometimes I'm interviewing these people. So obviously we chit chat about little things when we get down to business. So, um, you know. It all depends, right? It all depends. Other people out there I would still like to meet? Yeah. I would love to meet Tony Iommi, man. That, that would be like the be-all, end-all. Um, I still would love to meet Richie Blackmore one of these days. I would, I would love to. I, I came close to meeting him and talking to him recently, but I would love to sit down and talk to Michael Shanker. Um, I would love to sit down and talk to David Coverdale. would love it. So, a lot, all sorts of people. Uh, what else we got here? From Lonnie V, Pete. Lately, you have stated that when it comes to many double albums, you sometimes prefer the less is more attitude towards them, as you feel many double albums would have been better if released as a great single album. In this day of ultra deluxe multi disc box sets, issuing bonus tracks, rehearsals, live cuts, etc., providing us with tons of extra content, I'm wondering if you have ever had the reverse inclination upon hearing such a set that a single album would have made an even better double album if it had contained many of the tracks in the aforementioned box set. Woo, Lonnie, my God. Enjoy your work. I look forward to every video produced. Um, I would say Jethro Tull. Okay. I mean, God, they put out those re Jethro Tull remasters, like what, in the 90s, early 2000s, and every one of them had like a handful of great bonus tracks of tunes that were recorded during the sessions that were never released or part of B-sides and whatever. And in most cases, all those bonus tracks, those, you know, were, were great and should have been on the regular albums and would have made those great albums even greater. So that is my first choice, Jethro Tull. Man, go! I'm telling you, they they Tull put out like these couple box sets, and they had all these great bonus tracks. I'm like, oh, these are fucking great. And then they released the remasters, and I went and bought those CDs again. And but the, the remasters had those those bonus tracks, those tracks that were recorded during those sessions that were not released on the album proper, and there they were now on the CD with the rest of the album. And I'm like, perfect. That's where they belong, and they make that album even greater. From Patrick King, hey Pete, I know you have a busy schedule, but would you ever consider doing a rant video on the worst album covers to otherwise great records? A few examples would be Accept Balls to the Wall, UFO No Heavy Petten, and of course the original cover to the Scorpions Virgin Killer. I'm sure you have a few that come to mind. Yeah, I actually went and put that on my to-do list for rant, so you're going to see that at some point. Thanks for the suggestion, that's a good one. From John Wilson, Pete, I want to get into black metal. Which black metal bands would you would be good for me to get into? Um... Okay, we had a bunch of folks who gave some suggestions in the comments section, but I'm going to throw some here. Uh, Enslaved, number one, do it. Uh, Emperor, Mayhem, Borknagar, Early Dimmu Borgia, Early Cradle of Filth, Early Satyricon, Early Dark Throne. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, but Burzum, you might as well give some of that early Burzum stuff a listen. Uh, even though what I just said about Gorgoroth a few minutes ago, their early stuff is damn good. Uh, if you want to get like back to the beginning where it kind of all started, how about Venom, Bathory, Celtic Frost, and Merciful Fate? That's kind of how black metal got its kind of birth. So there's some good ones for you. And our last question for the day from Rand Kelly. Hey, Pete, thank you so very much for all that you do. I have delved into many bands you recommended, but I've never heard of them, and now I'm a fan of a bunch of them. Great. That's what this is all about. Exposure to Exposure is what it's all about, which leads me to my question. You may or may not be aware that our... There are a crap ton of a new trend on YouTube called first reaction videos recently that is becoming a phenomenon. I won't get into all the names of these people, but I will say a lot of prog gets requested and obscure stuff too. So I think it's a good thing, even if the reactor doesn't like something, they explain why and that they can still be helpful. Some of these people are making a lot of money through 
Patreon charging up to $75 to get their song to the top of the list because they have thousands of subscribers. I don't pay anyone, I just watch what happens. What do you think about these reaction videos? Do you think they help spread music, great music, or do it a disservice? I, I just noticed this about six months ago. Uh, well, Ram, we actually covered this, I don't know, a month or two ago. Someone else asked the, pretty much the same question. Um, I kind of ignore these things now. You know, back last year, uh, Weeaboo we reacts. I, I watched him for a couple months just because I thought his, I thought it was amusing, you know, where he's just, you know, he's this young black kid and he's watching, uh, you know, metal and hard rock videos, bands for the first time ever. And to see the look on his face, it goes, and, and it's always priceless. It's just like, he's just like, cause you know, I don't know what he listened to before he started doing this, but obviously he had no exposure to guitar players and these singers and all the grandeur of the seventies and the eighties and all that kind of stuff. So I, I found it humorous for a bit, but after a while, you know, I still kind of enjoyed watching him and what he was saying, but then I started reading the comments and feedback and all you got was people just saying, Oh, do this band next, do this song next. It's like, it's like all they really care about is, it, it, you know, there's no like, Oh, that's cool. I never heard that song before. I'm going to dive into their catalog. It's just like, Oh, well I, I know, uh, do uh, fear factory next or do they just like, you know, and it's just like, so I don't know how successful these guys, and I saw one, I saw another one recently, some other guy, he looked like a rap guy, um, and he, he talked like a rap guy, and he, you know, he's a little older than the We Have a who's he was a kid, um, but this guy was older, and, you know, you could totally tell he was hamming it up for the, uh, for the camera, like trying really hard to be that cool rap guy, now I'm, I'm, I'm doing a reaction to this, you know, this metal band, whatever. And it's like, Oh, I've never heard of this. Wow. It's like, you know, and I'm just like, I think some of them are doing it just because that's the flavor of the month. Now, let me be cool. Let me try and, and create a persona and watch and talk about music that I never would listen to ever, you know, and see if people get off on it. I just don't know how many people like us are watching that stuff saying, Oh, cool. You know, I never heard that band Judas Priest. I'm going to go check out that album. Or our friends and people who are maybe, you know, of that person who's doing the reaction video, just watching it and getting a laugh at some of the shit that they're saying. I don't know. I, like I said, I don't pay a lot of attention to it, but I know some of these reaction people are, they're getting subscribers by the thousands. They're probably making good money off of doing these videos. And are they helping anybody? I don't know. I guess it's just entertainment, right? That's kind of what a lot of this stuff is. So I don't know. I just know I don't watch them anymore. I got tired of that pretty quickly. It just, I lost interest in it. It was funny for a month or two, but then I was just kind of like, eh, whatever. I know all these songs. I love all these songs in these bands. So why do I have to sit here and spend 10 minutes listening to some, go, some you know, kid going, oh, he's fucking great. Oh, he's got groove. Oh, man. Oh, man. Look at that. He fucking wails. Holy shit. I never heard that before. And I'm like, you know, like I said, after the first couple times, kind of humorous. After a while, I'm like, I already know this stuff is great. Why do I got to watch some kid who's never listened to Rainbow before, uh, you know, speak about the, the greatness in his first time watching of Ronnie James Dio, you know, because I think one of the ones I, the one of the ones I remember was uh, Rainbow, uh, was from the Rainbow Rising with Stargazer, and this kid was just like flabbergasted. And I'm just like, yeah, I've been flabbergasted for, you know, 40 years on that song. Okay. Are you going to, is he going to go, I mean, that's another thing. Are these people who are doing these first reaction videos, are they actually taking any of these these bands or these songs or music after they do a reaction of it and they say they really like it, are they going and listening to the band? Probably not. But who am I to say? I mean, I'm just guessing that. So anyway, that's it, guys. This is on the web at www.cetranquilly.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube. I uh, went a little long today. I didn't expect to, but I guess I picked too many questions. So I, I want to keep these 40 minutes and, and under, and we're almost in an hour. So uh, we're starting to see a lot of duplicate questions again, guys. So if you're not hearing your... Uh, questions answered that's probably it or you know they're just some of the questions were kind of like a, I can answer that in a word so I, I tend to not go for those but uh, anyway we'll see you next time stay tuned for another questions and answer hopefully next Saturday well, maybe not next well we'll see may not get to one next weekend because I'm going to be kind of busy but we'll see how it goes um, and I'll be away for a couple days on business but uh, you'll see some stuff from me periodically during the week all right so till then take care bye-bye